morning dear students now uh, after discussing uh, block number second of british drama we would like to discuss a uh, block number third in block number second we try to discuss about uh, various features related to william shakespeare and we try to discuss about william shakespeare there and there we uh, also uh, came to know about various dramas written by william shakespeare and particularly about a midsummer night's dream and hamlet that are prescribed in our syllabus so in that uh, block number second we also came to know about uh, the special features and the specialities uh, of william shakespeare for uh, which he is known in english literature now we would like to discuss about ben johnson and uh, about his uh, contribution for the english drama and uh, Uh, the particular drama of ben johnson that is prescribed in our syllabus we would like to discuss about certain features of ben johnson's dramas ben johnson who was born on 11 june 1572 and died on 6th august 1637 was an english playwright poet and literary critic of the 17th century whose artistry exerted a lasting impact upon english poetry and stage comedy he popularized the comedy of humors he is best known for the satirical plays every man in his humor that was published in 1598 ballpone or the fox that was published in 1605 the alchemist that was published in 1610 and bartholomew fair a comedy that was published in 1614 so as a matter of fact he is known ben johnson is known for the satirical plays in which you see some of uh, the given plays some of the uh, important satirical plays are included like every man in his humor ballpone or the fox the alchemist bartholomew fair etc and for his lyric poetry he is generally regarded as the second most important english dramatist after william shakespeare during the reign of James first so uh, as a matter of fact ben johnson uh, was you see compared with william shakespeare uh, as far as drama writing is concerned and johnson was a classically educated well read and cultured man of english renaissance with an appetite for controversy personal and political artistic and intellectual whose cultural influence was of unparalleled breadth upon the playwrights and the poets of the jacobian era and of the carolingian era so uh, you see actually he was a very famous and outstanding personality of the renaissance age and he is known for uh, you see his satirical drama writing uh, so uh, you see in the field of drama writing he is considered he is compared with william shakespeare also Johnson has been called the first poet laureate is a very important point is a very important feature of ben johnson is, uh, that is often asked in the examinations also who was the first poet laureate of english so ben johnson was the person who was the first poet laureate he was appointed as the first poet laureate of english literature Uh, if johnson's reputation as a playwright has traditionally been linked to shakespeare his reputation as a poet has since the early 20th century been linked to that of john dun once again this is an another important feature related to uh, you see ben johnson as far as the drama is concerned he is compared with shakespeare as far as playwriting is con uh, uh, concerned he is considered with shakespeare and if the poetry writing if uh, someone asks of poetry writing then ben johnson is considered with john dun so john dun actually in the field of poetry writing he is compared with john dun in this comparison johnson represents the cavalier strain of poetry emphasizing grace and clarity of expression dun by contrast epitomizes the metic metaphysical school of poetry with its reliance on strained baroque metaphors and often vague phrasing since the critics who made this comparison herbert gerson for example 
but to varying extents rediscovering done. This comparison often worked to the detriment of Johnson's reputation. So this was the reputation of uh, Ben Johnson that he was compared with the best of the field. You see, uh, as far as the playwriting is concerned, he is considered with William Shakespeare and uh, for the poetry writing he is compared with John Donne. So, you see, uh, uh, people and the critics also started following him and his art of writing. In his time, Johnson was at least as influential as Dunn. Johnson was not very much influential at the time, you see, when Dunn was alive and both of them were contemporaries, as a matter of fact. So, uh, uh, you see, Johnson was not as influential as John Dunn was. In 1623, his historian Edmund Walton named him the best and most polished English poet. So it was Edmund Bolton who actually called him that he was a most polished English poet, that this judgment was widely shared, is indicated by the admitted influence he had on younger poets. The grounds for describing Johnson as the father of cavalier poets are clear. Many of the cavalier poets described themselves as his sons or his tribe. And you won't believe that, you see, after uh, the remarks of Edmund Bolton, uh, you see, many people started liking him. And uh, you see, younger poets uh, had a great influence on them. Uh, and younger poet, poets started taking inspiration from Ben Johnson. And uh, so many cavalier poets started deeming him as their father. For some of this tribe, the connection was as much social as poetic. Herrick described the meetings at the sun, the dog, the triple tune. So all of them, including those like Herrick, whose accomplishments in verse are generally regarded as superior to Johnson's, took inspiration from Johnson's revival of classical forms and themes, his subtle melodies, and his disciplined use of bet. So he, he is noted for his classical forms of themes and subtle melodies and his disciplined use of bit. In these respects, Johnson may be regarded as among the most important figures in the prehistory of English neoclassicism. So because of the certain features of his works, because of the certain features of his style of writing, he is regarded as the most important figure in the prehistory of English neoclassicism. The best of Johnson's lyrics have remained current since his time. Periodically, they experience a brief vogue, as after the publication of Peter Bailey's edition of 1756. Johnson's poetry continues to interest scholars for the light which it sheds on English literary history. So, uh, you see, the poetry of uh, Ben Johnson is a kind of light poetry. It creates a kind of amusement and entertainment, uh, you see, in the, in the minds of scholars. So, uh, 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 Johnson's poetry actually continues to interest scholars for the light which it sheds on English literary history, such as politics, systems of patronage, and intellectual attitudes. And it has some subjects to offer, like politics, systems of patronage, and intellectual attitudes. So it discusses about uh, the, the, the uh, subjects of politics and uh, the subjects of systems of patronage and intellectual attitudes. For the general reader, Johnson's reputation rests on a few lyrics that, though brief, are surpassed for grace and precision by very few Renaissance poems. On my first, Sunny, to Celia, to Pantherist, and the epitaph on boy, player, solemn Pavy. So th these are some Renaissance poems by the pen of uh, Ben Johnson. And there he exercised his bit and the art of writing, my dear friends. 
Now we come for Alchemist. Alchemist is a comedy written by Ben Johnson. And you see this is the particular text that is prescribed in our syllabus. So uh, we need to understand Alchemist and its plot and its story and how it goes actually. It is a very interesting comedy and uh, that talks about uh, situational circumstances of a house that was given uh, by someone to his friend. So uh, we will understand the, uh, you see, the flow and how it goes actually. Uh, we will also understand, you see, the main things that are related to the play Alchemist. The Alchemist is a comedy by English playwright Ben Johnson, first performed in 1610 by the King's Man. It is generally considered Johnson's best and most characteristic comedy. Samuel Taylor Coleridge claimed that it had one of the three most perfect plots in literature. So uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, one of the prominent poets of uh, romantic age, says about uh, the alchemist and says that you see it has got uh, one of the three most perfect plots in English literature. The play's clever fulfillment of the classical unities and vivid de depiction of human folly have made it one of the few Renaissance plays except the works of Shakespeare. So it has become one of the most important uh, Renaissance plays except the, the works of Shakespeare with a continuing life on stage except for a period of neglect during the Victorian era. So because of its features and because of its unities, classical unities, it has become uh, one of the most famous, one of the most beautiful and celebrated plays except the works of Shakespeare. Uh, uh, we would like to understand the background of Alchemist in which background it started and uh, what is the background exactly uh, you see behind the writing of The Alchemist. The Alchemist premiered 34 years after the first permanent public theater, that theater opened in London. It is then a product of the early maturity of commercial drama in London. Only one of the university bits who had transformed drama in the Elizabethan period remained alive. This was Thomas Laws. In the other direction, the last great playwright to flourish before the intergenum. James Frilly was already a teenager. The theaters had survived the challenge uh, mounted by the city and religious authorities. Uh, plays were a regular feature of life at court and for a great number of Londoners. So, you see, uh, the alchemist uh, uh, was premiered sometimes later uh, because you see, uh, because of the some obstacles uh, in the theatrical performances. And in the venue for which Johnson apparently wrote his play reflects this newly solid acceptance of theater as a fact of city life. So the venue for which uh, Johnson apparently wrote his play reflects his newly solid acceptance of theater as a fact of city life. In 1597, the Lord Chamberlain's men, aka the King's men, had been denied permission to use the theater in Blackfriars as a winter playhouse because of objections from the neighborhood's influential residents. So, as we were talking, my dear friends, there were some interventions, there were some objections, and that is why the playhouse was not allowed to be used and, uh, because of some, you see, neighborhood's influential uh, uh, effects. Uh, uh, the playhouse was not allowed to be used uh, by the people. And sometime between 1608 and 1610, the company, now the king's man, reassumed control of the playhouse this time without objections. So this was the time actually from 1608 to 1610 where actually you see uh, King's men reassumed the control of the playhouse and there were no objections also. Their delayed premiere on this stage within the city walls along with royal patronage 
marks the ascendance of this company in the London play world. The Alchemist was among the first play chosen for performance at the theater. And my dear friends, this is what says about the popularity and about the acceptance of the play that the Alchemist was among the first plays chosen for performance at the theater. Johnson's play reflects this new confidence. In it, he applies his classical conception of drama to a setting in contemporary London for the first time with invigorating results. The classical elements, most notably the relation between Lubbock and Fisk. So actually, as a matter of fact, you see, uh, as we were talking in our earlier slides, my dear friends, Ben Johnson is compared, uh, as far as the drama is concerned, Ben Johnson is compared with William Shakespeare. And uh, with regard to poetry, he is compared with John Donne. Another feature of his playwriting is, uh, uh, he has got classical conception, he has got the classical features in his plays. The alchemist has also got those elements, my dear friends. In the same way, you see the story of the alchemist has got a very good relationship that is shared by uh, Lubbock and Face that has been fully modernized. In the same fashion, the depiction of Jacobian London is given order and direction by the classical understanding of comedy as a means to expose bias and foolishness to ridicule. So it has, uh, it has some of the, the features of, of the biases and foolishnesses to, to share and to discuss upon in this comedy. So here we go for synopsis. Actually, this is, uh, this is a part where we would like to understand the, the story lineup, the structure, and what are the important characters, who are the important characters, and uh, what is their role, and how they behave, and how they interact. So this is a kind of a story lineup. In the synopsis, we will also understand how the story goes and how the story uh, develops. We would like to uh, understand uh, the synopsis in its true sense. Then if we understand the synopsis, then uh, to answer the questions will become an easy task. Here we go for synopsis, my dear friends. An outbreak of plague in London forces a gentleman Lubbock to flee temporarily to the country, leaving his house under the sole charge of his butler, Jeremy. So, uh, you see, because there was an outbreak of plague in London, and that is why there was a gentleman, Lubbock, and he had to go, actually. He had to temporarily go, and then uh, he made uh, uh, his butler, Jeremy, uh, as the soul in charge of his house because there was no other option left with him. And you see, this opportunity of using the house was given to Mr. Jeremy and Jeremy uses the opportunity given to him to use the house as the headquarters for fraudulent acts. He transforms himself into Captain Face and enlists the aid of subtle, a fellow cornman and doll common a prostitute. So you see this opportunity of using the house was given to uh, Mr. Jeremy and he, he started making the fullest use of the, the house and he made uh, the, the home as the headquarters of all uh, fraudulent activities and he gathered some of the people to do all sorts of activities. The play opens with a violent argument between subtle and face concerning the division of the riches which they have and will continue to gather, Dole breaks the pair apart and reasons with them that they must work as a team if they are to succeed. So, you see, there was a, there was a harsh discussion and dialogues between subtle and face. So, Dole actually comes between and she says that, you see, if you want to make money, if you want to get success, 
you have to work in a team. Their first customer is a dapper, a liar's clerk who wishes subtle to use his supposed neuromatic skills to summon a familiar or spirit to help in his gambling ambitions. The tree part types suggest that Dapper may bend favor with the queen of fairy, but he must subject himself to humiliating rituals in order for her to help him. Their second gull is Drugger, a tobacconist, who is keen to establish a profitable business. Uh, the second gull is Drugger, uh, who was a tobacconist, and uh, he was very keen to establish a profitable business. After this, a wealthy nobleman, Sir Epicure Mammon, arrives. Expressing his desire to gain himself the philosopher's stone, which he believes will bring him huge material and spiritual wealth, he is accompanied by Surly, a skeptic and debunker of the whole idea of alchemy. He is promised the philosopher's stone and promised that it will turn all base metal into gold. Surly, however, suspects Subtle of being a thief. Mammon accidentally sees Doll and is told that she is a lord's sister who is suffering from madness. Subtle told that she is a lord's sister who is suffering from madness. Subtle contrives to become angry with Ananias, a anaptist, and demands that he should return with more senior member of his sect. Drugger returns and is given false and ludicrous advice about setting up his shop. He also brings news that a rich young widow and her brother Castrel have arrived in London. Both Subtle and Face, in their greed and ambition, seek out to win the widow. The Anabaptists return and agree to pay for goods to be transmuted into gold. You see, after some time, this Anabaptist return and he agrees to pay for goods to be transmuted into gold. These are in fact Mammon's goods. Dapper returns and is promised that he shall meet with the queen of fairy soon. Dragar brings Castrel, who on being told that Subtle is a skilled matchmaker, rushes to fetch his sister. Drugger is given to understand that the appropriate payment might secure his marriage to the widow. Dapper is blindfolded and subjected to fairy humiliations. But on the reappearance of Mammon, he is gazed and hastily thrust into the privy. Mammon is introduced to Doll. He has been told that Doll is a nobleman's sister who has gone mad. But he is not put off and pays her extravagant compliments. Castrel and his sister come again. Castrel is given a lesson in quarreling. Castrel is given a lesson in quarreling, and the widow captivates both face and subtle. They quarrel over who is to have her. And because you see, uh, the, the, the fight was there, and the, that struggle was there, that argument was there. So. Uh, the quarrel was over who is to have her. This was the main point to have the quarrel. Surly returns, disguised as a Spanish nobleman. See, she becomes, you see, a Spanish nobleman. Face and subtle believe that uh, the Spinevard speaks no English and they insult him. They also believe that he has come for a woman. They also believe that a Spaniard has come for a woman. But Doll is elsewhere in the building engaged with Mammon. So Face has the inspiration of using damn pliant. She is reluctant to become a Spanish countess, but is vigorously persuaded by her brother to go off with Surly. The tricksters need to get rid of Mammon. Doll contrives a fit. And there is an explosion from the laboratory. Doll contrives, in the meantime, Doll contrives a fit. And there is an explosion 
from the laboratory. In addition, the lady's furious brother is hunting for a mammon who leaves. Surly reveals his true identity to Dame Pliant and hopes that she will look on him favorably as a consequence. And in the meantime, you see, she reveals uh, and told uh, that, uh, she revealed and told that uh, this is what my identity is. And uh, you see, and uh, she also hopes that she will look on him favorably as a consequence. Surly reveals his true identity to face and subtle and denounces them. In quick succession, Castrel, Drezer and Ananias returns and are set on Surly, who retreats. Duggar is told to go and find a Spanish costume if he is to have a chance of claiming the widow. Doll brings news that the master of the house has returned. And in the meantime, a shocking news comes and uh, you see Doll brings the news that the real master of the house has come back. Longwits never tell him that his house had many visitors during his absence. So uh, we know actually uh, 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 the house was given to Jeremy and it was in a particular and peculiar situation Lubbit thought uh, of surrendering or giving charge of his house to Mr. Jeremy. And you see what happens when Lubbit comes back, uh, you see when Lubbit comes back then his neighbors uh, started telling him everything. They told him everything that his house was misused and uh, you see many people were coming there, many visitors were coming there in his absence and they were uh, making use or making misuse of the house. Faces now the plausible Jeremy again and denies the accusation. He has kept the house locked up because of the plague. And on the other hand, Jeremy says that no, he has not misused that uh, on the other hand, he has uh, kept the home as Lord. Surly Mammon, Castrel, and the Anabaptists return. There is a cry from the preby. Daper has chewed through his gag. Jeremy can no longer maintain his fiction. But as we know, actually, this was all a uh, lie and he could not maintain his fiction because there was no reality, there was no truth. He promises Lubbit that if he pardons him, he will help him obtain himself a rich widow. Daper meets the queen of fairy and departs happily. Dragar delivers the Spanish costume and is sent to find a person face tell subtle and all that he has confessed to Lubbit and that officers are on the bay. Subtle and Doll have to flee empty handed. So later on actually he confessed the, the thing that uh, it was because of his mistake and he misused the home but he wanted to be forgiven. And when this idea came to uh, face and all, so they also started fleeing from there because the officers were on the bay and they had to flee from there. The victims come back again and Lubbit has married the widow and claimed Mamun's goods. Surly and Mammon departs disconsolately and Anabaptists and Drugger are summarily dismissed. Uh, this was a, a very good thing to be done with them and Castrel accepts his sister's marriage to uh, Lubbit. Lubbit pays tribute to the ingenuity of his servant and face asks for the audience forgiveness. So this was actually a uh, face asked for the uh, forgiveness from the side of the uh, audience. So this was actually uh, the drama by uh, uh, you see Ben Johnson and it actually expresses the things of a house and a relationship and the behavior of the individuals with each other. So I hope that you must have got the point. Thank you.